Hello, everyone. Welcome to our latest classical conversation for the 2021-22 National Symphony Classical Season. I'm Jessica Slays, Vice President of Art Artistic Administration for the National Symphony, and I'm so pleased to be joined again by music director Giancarlo Guerrero. How are you, Giancarlo? Hi, Jess. Good to see you. Good to see you, too. Thanks for joining us from Seattle today. Uh, so we are here in our next classical program entitled Beethoven's First, featuring, of course, Beethoven's First Symphony, uh, Poulenc's Organ Concerto, and Stravinsky's Symphony of Win Symphonies of Winds Instruments, which is neither in form a symphony nor exclusive to woodwinds. So tell us a little bit about this amazing little piece. Well, the first thing that you notice is the title, which is not symphony, but symphonies. And the idea behind it is that uh, Stravinsky was relying on the, uh, the, the name, the, the title symphony, which actually comes from Greek, which is a collection of sounds. And he didn't want to think of this as just a one piece, but more of a collection of these sonorities that basically came from wind instruments. And not only the woodwinds, but this includes the brass as well. And uh, if you're familiar with the great three ballets that he wrote, uh, the Firebird, Petrushka, and the Rite of Spring, they are very much uh, uh, geared towards wind writing. He utilized uh, the wind writing even more, more so than strings. The strings, in many cases, provided a lot of the rhythmic power behind all of these pieces. So Stravinsky was particularly adept at writing very well for uh, the wind instruments, but also incredibly challenging. I can tell you that a lot of musicians not only enjoy playing the music of Stravinsky because it's very rewarding, it's very difficult, but it's also very scary to play because he was never afraid to push the envelope. But here it's basically, it's a symphony orchestra, but without the strings and without percussion. And uh, the piece was really more of an homage to the great composer Claude Debussy, who was a great friend of Stravinsky in his early years, and even more importantly, was a great champion of Stravinsky and pushed uh, his name and uh, became a great admirer from the very beginning. And when Claude Debussy died in 1918, uh, Stravinsky wrote this piece in memory of, 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 of his death. And uh, this piece has become really one of the most performed pieces, particularly in wind bands all over the world. Uh, if you go to wind ensembles and universities and stuff, this is like standard repertoire, like Beethoven 5 is for orchestras. Uh, and once again, because of COVID, this has given us a chance to bring some of these pieces that perhaps are not as standard in the symphonic repertoire, but yet they belong in there as well. And it is very much vintage Stravinsky because it is from 1920. And uh, he's still very much in that idea of the ballet, the Rite of Spring. Uh, and this happened. All three of those have happened. And now. Correct. Here. So, and he was, he had already made a name for himself. And, uh, and, and uh, so this work really captures, I think, a lot of that same sonority that we may be familiar in those ballets. It is incredibly colorful. There is everything that you can imagine from darkness to brightness and very much vintage Stravinsky, rhythmically incredibly difficult, complex. Uh, I will tell you that as a conductor, this is a piece that usually comes up in uh, auditions for conductors because it is a minefield. It is a piece that changes constantly, even though the music feels very much like a nice arch, there is a lot of changes in the meters and uh, we have to literally be on the edge of our seats. But uh, this is a piece that I have uh, done a few times myself and I find it one of the real wonderful jewels of symphonic music. And uh, it gives a chance to showcase not only the wind players, but to showcase a different sonority of what an orchestra can sound like. And uh, I know that, that, that uh, my players in the Nashville Symphony are really looking forward to playing it because many of them they may have only played it when they were in college, and here we get a chance to play it in a professional setting. Absolutely, and in our beautiful hall, I agree. It has such great colors and fun and such character. It, it really is an incredible gem. Thank you so much for bringing that to the top of this program. Uh, then we move into another treasure of ours, which is our organ. Um, incredible organ that we have with, to feature in Pollock's Organ Concerto. And we also have our organist and soloist joining us today, Andrew Reisinger. Good afternoon, Andrew. How are you? Hi, Jess. Great. Good to see you. Hi, John Carlo. <laughs> hey, Andrew. Great to see you. Looking forward to our collaboration. Thank you. Me too. Well, the Poulenc, and we were talking about this a little bit before uh, this broadcast, that uh, it was written by an organist. So the fact that you have somebody that was so 
knowledgeable about the instrument. Uh, I'm sure you're grateful for the fact that you have somebody that understood how to write for the instrument. So uh, can you tell us a little bit about what it involves from your point of view of playing this, this incredible piece? Yes, it's, um, I think it's a great showcase of the actual instrument. Uh, Poulenc, along with a lot of other French composers, made very specific indications in the score about what colors they want from the organ. And while an organist is certainly free to do whatever they wish, I like to follow what he puts in the score because if you do that, by the time you finish the piece 20 minutes later, it really has been basically a parade of all the various solo colors that we have available. I mean, there's an oboe stop, there's a clarinet stop, there's a special combination of color stops we call a cornet. Um, you have the absolutely softest sounds that the instrument can make that just almost disappear. And then you have the whole organ as well. It's just, it's it's quite a quite a showcase of the organ's range in its various colors. Well, I know that that instrument basically has, in, in, in any instrument, probably the most unlimited uh, possibilities of colors and combinations of sounds that you can get. How long does it usually take you to program all of this into, I guess, the computer in, in the organ to make it work? Because, I mean, before the first rehearsal, like you said, you have to make decisions on how, how to combine all of these sounds. I would say at a minimum it would take probably several hours but what's really great is if you do an initial setup and you go away and you think about it and then you come back and you'll start to you know do a little bit of tweaking here and there just just making some different choices that will bring out something a little bit different and you start to adjust things it's it, you you really can spend a lot of time doing that and it's fortunately we've had plenty of time available lately where i've been able to go into the hall and really spend some time listening to the colors and and working with the instrument and uh, yeah i i really enjoy that part of the process so, oh i'm sure it's like playing with a new toy isn't it sure <laughs> even now <laughs> it's <laughs> yeah i mean i can only imagine i mean i always think of my when when i see the the console it, it looks like something out of star trek i mean you know the 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 that I mean, you literally have all of these buttons and all these things that I find it incredibly fascinating of all the possibilities and the fact now that we have, you know, 21st century technology that everything is sure. computer controlled and all you have to press this button and everything just happens. But still, uh, there are some things about, about this instrument that are still very old fashioned from, you know, 800 years ago, right? Oh, absolutely. Yes. In fact, since you brought that up, you know, the, the piece in some ways mimics uh, box the beginning of Bach's Fantasia in G minor. I mean, the very opening chord is that same one. And then very quickly, of course, he diverts and you hear that incredibly colorful and dissonant language and you're like, oh yes, that's blank. But uh, yeah, so he, because you and I were talking about that too, he definitely gives a nod to the ancient traditions, even though it's his 20th century, very colorful language. Well, the piece is from 1938, uh, premiered in 1939, and it was commissioned by Princess Edmond de Polignac, which sounds very, you know, royal and very important. But actually, I found out that her actual name was Winneret Singer, and she yes. was the heiress <laughs> to the Singer Sewing Company, which, you know, we all remember having those around the house. Yep. Isn't that funny? And it was used for a competition, right? I mean, eventually it became a mandatory piece for a big organ competition at the time, correct? I think so. And, and I love also knowing that Maurice Durofle was the first performer of the concerto. I mean, because he is another favorite composer of the French tradition. And so, yeah, knowing that, that he was the one that first brought it to life is especially fun to know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The other thing that going back to the whole idea of the current times with COVID and limitations of space and what have you, uh, the other reason why I chose this piece particularly is because the orchestration works perfectly. It's rather unusual because, of course, we have the organ soloist, we have only strings, uh, uh, you know, so it's different from the symphonies of wind instruments. So here we have only the strings with the organ, but with the added bonus of a timpani player, which in mm -hmm. many cases also becomes like a second soloist. Yes, absolutely. I find that there, there's just this very uh, closely linked dialogue between the timpanist and the organist. And then sometimes it's almost like the strings are there to comment between passages of the organ, but then sometimes the strings also 
in the organ magnify each other at the same time. So it's it's a great it's a great orchestration. Well, you mentioned of course Bach, and and I think it's impossible. I think for an organist to write a piece without having that you know big ghost behind them. You know, with you know all of the what we think of, of organ music. Of course, Bach was was perhaps one of the you know, the greatest perhaps of, of them all. But at the same yeah. time, you mentioned this already. There is a lot of very uh, 20th century writing in this. There's even jazz stuff in there, which mm -hmm. was very popular in France. That, so I find this piece fascinating because it's a wonderful combination of some of those very, very uh, uh, serious traditions of organ playing from the Baroque era, you know, with Bach. But at the same time, you hear a lot of this very lighthearted French jazzy things on it, yes. which normally you would never associate with an organ. But yet, it is incredibly effective. Plus, the timpani adds a little bit more of that rhythmic, uh, 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 you know, feel to it. Which, I, I, as I said, I find it incredibly original. Absolutely, yeah. I just his his playfulness at times, I think, is is excellent. At the same time, that it has these incredibly serious moments. So it's to me, the whole piece is a study in juxtapositions like that. You know, the the softest, the yeah, loudest, well, most playful and whimsical, and then the most serious. So. And you just mentioned something. One thing that this audience is going to get is that that organ, you're going to hear it because, I mean, like what you expect, Poulenc unleashes, you know, all of the demons from the instrument. So although you may get intimate moments, you know, playfulness, from the very beginning, you will get this massive sound that you have to experience live. And we are so fortunate mm -hmm. at the Skammerhorn to have one of the best instruments, I think, in the world that when, when those of us who have had the pleasure of experiencing it and our audience members, that's what we look forward to, is that powerful uh, experience. And it's so, I mean, it, it truly is uh, something that you have to be there to do it. There's no recording, there's no uh, stereo system that could ever recreate that power. And let's face it, Poulenc really, I mean, using the quote, pulls all the stops. Yes, yes, now that's a very good point you make that it's just, you can hear the colors on a recording, but but an organ is such a physical sound. It's something that you really have to feel in person to get the full effect. So I, I'm so thrilled that we get to bring the organ back to the audiences this season. So I'm really looking forward well, to it. Well, as I said, I mean, this, this time of, of, of COVID and, and pandemic, I mean, has opened the door to, to bring some of this repertoire that otherwise sometimes gets overlooked. Uh, and uh, and the orchestration is just perfect for the current situation that we are, but we're still getting the full effect. So for that, I am truly grateful, and more importantly, the chance that we get to make music again. We've collaborated in the past with quite a few uh, organ projects, but this one we've never done, so I'm particularly looking forward to, to collaborating this. Yes, on this me too. Video. Well, thank you for choosing it. I'm really looking forward to it. Thank you so much, Andrew. We are fortunate. Well, we will be seeing you very soon. Thank you again, Andrew. My pleasure. Thank you all. <laughs> well, that brings us to Beethoven's first symphony. Uh, it seems well known and straightforward, but this piece is such a, a crux in history, so important, such a turning point. Um, and we were prepared to bring this to audiences last fall, and, and here we are. Uh, so. Tell us what this piece means to you and what it's doing here anchoring our program. Well, of course, we have the nine symphonies of Beethoven, which are Mount Everest for conductors to be able to conduct them all. But I'm going to be honest with you. The first is my favorite. When he was 30 years old. So this is not the work of a child prodigy. This is the work of a, of a man who is in the early part of his maturity and uh, experimenting with something that was very popular, particularly with Haydn and Mozart. The writing of a symphony was your presentation card. And to do his first symphony in Vienna really took a lot of guts. And it was quite risky as well because he had not made a name for himself in a program, by the way, that included a lot of his own music. And uh, it was bold. And I will tell you, the opening note of the Beethoven one is one of the most consequential in the history of music because it changed everything that we were to believe about how symphonies were written. Uh, it's very simple. The symphony is in C major. So when you play a symphony in C major, you're supposed to open in C major. That's what is expected. And Beethoven does that, but with a twist. He adds a B flat on that first chord in the winds, which makes that C major chord, which is supposed to give you some sense of 
of, of, of stability completely gives you a chord that is unstable, that needs to resolve. So when you hear that first chord, it almost sounds wrong, like somebody's making a big mistake. And from that first note, Beethoven is already telling the world that he's going to change our ideas of music, that he is not afraid with his imagination to challenge not only the musicians, but the audience as well. And for the first introduction, which is very slow, he's really experimenting with harmonies. And when you finally get to a major chord, a sense of like, okay, we have arrived somewhere, he gives you the key of G major, which is not C major, which is what you were advertised. And from then on, it just becomes a true experiment in music writing. I can promise you that audience in 1800 must have been really shocked that here comes this composer trying to make a name for himself and all of a sudden throwing all of the traditions out the window and basically telling us that, no, I am going to be my own person. And that is why the symphony to me is my favorite because this one really tells us about what comes next with the second, the third, the fourth, the fifth, all the way to ninth. Beethoven was truly a revolutionary, a maverick in every sense of the word, in his orchestral writing, in his piano writing, in his string quartets. The level of imagination that this man had still continues to astound me. And I will tell you, even in the 21st century, I still hear that first chord and I always go, I mean, it blows my mind. I, and I agree, yeah. It, it is, is absolutely amazing moment. beyond yeah. anything that anybody had ever heard and has done ever since, by the way. So when you think of great first symphonies, and uh, let's face it, I mean, writing your first symphony for a composer, again, it's it's got to be so scary because you're going to be compared to what came before. And in the case of Beethoven, Mozart and Haydn pretty much had written the book on it. Yeah. So again, it took a lot of guts from a composer that was just trying to name, make a name for himself, but at the same time was not going to play the same games everybody was doing. He was not afraid to do this. And for that, we salute him. Uh, and that's why we celebrate him. It has the usual four movements, like Mozart and Haydn. He did not stay away from that. Um, and the thing that he did, normally the third movement, you have a minuet, which is this one, two, three, one, two, three, which 99% of all symphonies at the time had. So when he gets to the third movement, that's what people were expecting. And then he said, nope, I'm not doing that. I'm going to do a scherzo, which is literally a minuetto on steroids. It's a minuetto at warp speed, which goes actually in one, one, two, three, 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 which becomes incredibly virtuosic. And I can promise you, again, the audience probably said, where's my minuet? I'm supposed to be dancing to this. So once again, also, he threw it out the window. The second movement is supposed to be a slow adagio, lyrical. No, he said, andante con moto, this so this symphony really doesn't have a slow movement. The whole symphony seems to have this momentum. And then the last movement, he gives you a rondo, which is basically one melody, which we call melody A. And then you get a melody B, and then you go back to A. And then you go a melody C, and then you go back to A again. So you have this little game going. And it is just so charming. It is beyond one of the most beautiful, challenging, charming symphonies I have ever encountered. Um, and I will also tell you, this was the first piece I ever conducted with an orchestra in public for my graduation recital at the university. So this piece is very close to me. I'm going to conduct the Chicago Symphony, and I'm doing this symphony as well. This is how important this piece is to me. And uh, um, I know that our very sophisticated audiences in Nashville will totally understand what I am talking about when I say that this symphony, even, even though it's now 221 years old, it still has the ability to impress us and has the ability to keep us on the edge of our seats. That's fantastic. I love those personal connections. And I, I agree, this is one of the pieces I always want to listen to is if it's the first time and think about that moment because there are all of those incredibly innovative innovative things. And we are so glad to be back with the ability to treasure hearing it live instead of just on demand uh, and remember how special that moment is to be together. So thanks so much for your time and talking about the program again today. Thank you everyone who joined us to listen to Giancarlo today. We're looking forward to seeing you at these performances at the Skirmerhorn Symphony Center, October 21, 22, and 23. Find out more and purchase your tickets at nationalsymphony.org. Have a good day.